evolution is true, new species should emerge over time. But if creation is true, new species should emerge even quicker. That's our topic this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. And our topic this week is speciation, yes. Evolution, no. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, poorly informed anti-creationist scoffers uh, occasionally think they will floor their creationist opponents right. uh, with examples of species forming in nature. Right. And that, that's a, it's a huge issue. Uh, they're often surprised at the reaction they get from better informed creationists, uh, namely that the creation model depends heavily on speciation. Right. Yeah. I mean, some of the confusion comes because evolutionists and creationists believe similar things sometimes, yes. yep. right, uh, about biodiversity, but of course disagree strongly about other things. And for example, most evolutionists believe that all life came from one original kind right? And then that kind of creature gradually changed into all of the kinds um, that we see today. And of course, that's, that's you know, often explained in that tree of life. Everybody right. kind of yep. has seen that diagram. We've got one uh, point here and then it branches out into all the different things. And uh, you see all these uh, branching, you know, offshoots, etc. And um, of course, that, that, that means totally unique, different types of creatures came from that one original Yes. Uh, type of creature. Yeah, but creationists believe in more of an orchard scenario. If you want to picture that, instead of the tree of evolution, you have the orchard scenario, uh, where God created all the original kinds, and as time goes by, species, different species arrive within those kinds. They, they derive from the original created kind. Right. But uh, we wouldn't be like the evolutionists saying that everything came from, from one example. So not new kinds of creatures, uh, like a lizard turning into a bird, for example, but horses making new species of horses right. within the horse kind. That's, that's what the orchard scenario uh, suggests. Right. There. Now, it, it seems clear that some of the groupings above the species level, for example, genera, um, and sometimes higher up in the hierarchy of different kinds, are almost certainly linked by common ancestry. That is, they're, they're descendants of one created ancestral population. Right? Yes. The created kind, or, or what uh, we would call baramin. And virtually all creation theorists assume that, for example, Noah, uh, when he was putting the animals on the ark, um, he didn't have a pair of dingoes and a pair of wolves and, and coyotes and right, all that kind of right. stuff. Yep. He'd have a pair of creatures which were ancestral to all of those types of species and probably to a number of other day present species, um, but they were all the dog kind. The dog so kind, right. Yep. Demonstrating that speciation can happen in nature, especially where it can be shown to have happened today, is thus a, a positive evidence for creation. Right. A commonly heard objection is that surely speciation is evolution. That's right. an evolutionary scenario. And that the creationists are just postulating even more rapid post-flood evolution than evolutionists do. <laughs> right. that, that's, that's an objection that we hear. Well, you're just postulating, you're, you're, you're talking about evolution and yeah. it happening quickly. But the difference is all about genetic information. If we right. look at the details, that's where everything happens. The big picture of evolution is that protozoa become pelicans and palm trees and people and, and pomegranates and that kind of thing. Thus, it must have involved a process which, via natural causes, no God, no intelligence, increased the genetic instructions in the living world. Right, right. So rather than having a bunch of information that gets split up, and so you see different expressions of that information, you've actually got new information appearing that causes these new yes. uh, things. Now, yeah. now uh, the creationist assumes that, that these real substantial increases in information, right, that is uh, specifying for an increase, would never arise without intelligent uh, design. That's what science shows. That's right. <laughs> um, so at least uh, functional complexity, you know, is a new, if, if a creature doesn't have wings and then all of a sudden it has wings, well, that would be new genetic information that didn't exist in that kind before. Right. We'd say, no, no, no. Yeah. So speciation within the creation model will therefore be expected to occur uh, but, but we won't see increases in information, uh, specific uh, information for forms, functions, and features that were never there before. Yeah, and that's, that's what, what we're the saying. biblical model would suggest as well. That's right. Of course, these changes, uh, for example, speciation as a result of horizontal changes in information or the result of mutational defect or loss of information, 
do not in themselves offer evidence against the big picture of evolution. Um, however, they also don't demonstrate the validity of evolutionary belief, since they can be just as, evil, just as easily assigned a place within the creationist model, the biblical model. Right. And we'll have a look at some of those examples when we, get, when we come back. Half a century ago, Nobel Prize winning biologist Sir Peter Medawar made a startling comment. He declared that the survival of a child in a mother's womb contradicted immunological laws. Since the immune system normally detects foreign tissue and attacks it, you'd expect the mother's immune system to attack the genetically distinct child within her. Well, we now know that it actually does, but the baby survives by putting up a very specific defence. Researchers at the Medical College of Georgia discovered that mammalian embryos produce a special enzyme that suppresses the mother's killer T-cell action. A human embryo starts to produce this enzyme just before it attaches to the mother's uterus. This refutes a major argument used to support abortion, that the embryo is just a part of the mother's body to do with as she pleases. The research clearly shows that the human embryo is distinct from its mother from the beginning. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. This week we're talking about speciation, yes. Evolution, no. That's right. <laughs> Rapid speciation is a must for the creationist model. That's right. And, uh, of course, note that some anti-creationists, of course, have mockingly claimed that for the number of species that we see today to have descended from one pair coming off the ark, for example, would require that pair to have huge super chromosomes uh, to carry all that information needed. Now, while we can't say dogmatically that what we presently know uh, of genetic mechanisms is definitely sufficient to provide for all the post-flood variation that we see, and uh, in fact, some creationist thinkers have postulated there might be uh, yet undiscovered mechanisms as well, and we'll get into that later on in the show. Mm -hmm. um, we suggest that the converse has not been demonstrated either. Evolutionists have not demonstrated that you couldn't get that. Right. Um, just, just think of the variations of dogs, for example. Look yeah. at all the wild, wacky dogs, and evolutionists have admitted they all come <laughs> from wolves, so well, you know that can happen quickly. So all sexually reproducing uh, creatures contain their genetic information in paired form. So, okay. which means that for whatever trait this information codes for, let's say your eye color or whatever, you could be uh, homozygous, uh, which means you, uh, both copies of the uh, alleles are the same, or you could be heterozygous, which means that they're different. So one could per person could have, uh, you know, two different uh, eye colors, while another could only have uh, alleles that are the same. So ma uh, maximum heterozygosity um, at the beginning, when God originally created, uh, would, would surely give a massive variation potential if when God created, he created creatures with, with, with you know, different alleles for, for different traits. Right. Um, you know, just through natural selection, adaptation pressures, uh, Men Mendelian genetics, reshuffling and sorting of that, that type of information, you could have got substantial uh, you know, diversity uh, arise in a very, very short uh, time period, and uh, and that's actually been been demonstrated. Like like I mentioned, dogs, for example. Yeah, we've yeah, seen good all these variations, right. right? Yeah. However, in real the reality is that in the case of postul <laughs> uh, the, the postulated post flood variation in the creation model, the subgroups have the status of separate species. Right. And this is where it gets kind of tricky. Right. That is, even though uh, in, in some instances they breed in captivity, they, they generally don't do so in the wild, thus the mechanisms of speciation, particularly rapid speciation, far from causing creationists to shudder, <laughs> uh, are actually of great interest to us. It's exactly. a great area of study. Yeah. So what can cause speciation to happen quickly? Well, taking the most straightforward modern understanding of a species as a group of uh, organisms which can interbreed in nature, is not naturally and, and freely interbreed with each other, it's not hard to see how this sort of variation could easily lead to reproductive uh, incompatibility compatibilities, for example. Um, yeah. it, it may be, for instance, that sheer size difference would allow a population of Chihuahuas and Great Danes, for example, to be classified as separate it's, species. Yeah, because um, they no longer interbreed. Yeah, right. They just, yeah. they just don't get together, uh, obviously because of very obvious reasons, and they would be considered separate species, right? Right. Also, cutting populations off with physical barriers, uh, right. for example, mountain ranges, uh, uh, topographical uh, changes, that kind of thing, can easily isolate subsets of, of genes, so that could cause speciation as well. You have right. physical barriers that cause that. Yep. 
So understanding how these physical bar barriers could give rise to rapid speciation, it, that's always been fairly straightforward. Uh, nevertheless, the, the amount of post-flood speciation must have been staggering. We, we, we need to admit that because we look at all these, these variations, right? right? Yeah. Uh, particularly among insects. Um, it, it's hard to see how uh, there could have been that many physical barriers, for example, to, to cut off uh, you know, these founder populations and stuff like that in insects right. because of the massive yeah. variation. So there are some challenges there, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but it, it's both encouraging and fascinating for creationists, uh, biologists to note that there is now an increasing acceptance um, of the concept of sympatric speciation, right? And what that means is that populations can split into separate species even when there isn't no any kind of barrier. physical barrier, yeah. right? They're yeah. living together, but they, they speciate and, and things like that. Yeah, a major scientific conference on speciation held in Elsimar, California in May 1996. Uh, it, it reports about uh, reports about it appeared in Science Magazine afterwards, and when we come back, we'll show you more about the results of, uh, of that report. Maybe surprising to you. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Creation Ministries International focuses on the Bible's first book, Genesis, and the creation evolution issue. Many of our speakers are scientists with PhDs who, before joining CMI, were employed in various scientific fields. Creation Ministry speakers go to churches, equipping and encouraging people with the message of the truth and authority of the Bible and its relevance to the real world. To locate upcoming CMI events or inquire about booking a speaker into your church, visit creation.com. Welcome back. This week we're discussing speciation, yes, evolution, no. So yes, speciation takes place. Is it support for evolution? No. And we're giving the details here on, on this week's episode. That's right. Rapid speciation has to be part of the creation model. It does, yeah. That's right. Yep. So, Now, as, uh, as you mentioned, um, there was a major scientific conference on speciation held in Asilomar, California yeah. in May 1996. And uh, reports about it, of course, appeared in Science Magazine, major, major science magazines around the world. And at the conference in question, evidence of sympatric speciation, meaning that the, the population... Uh, of creatures could split into different species even while living in the same barrier or sorry in the same area, the same area with, yeah. with no separation no or physical barriers uh, was presented on this uh, sort of thing uh, having happened with ease in populations in certain types of fruit eating insects which used uh, the, the fruits of their host plant for courtship displays and, and mating. If one group of insects used to eating a certain type of fruit, for example, started to try a new host plant, then food choices became linked with mate choice, and so reproductive isolation began. And, and it's interesting that no one at the conference put any, forward any evidence that new genes arose by mutation or anything like that. And right. There was no new information that seemed to be required for any of these mechanisms. So here's evidence of creatures living together, suddenly sp speciating, becoming different species. I mean, when I was in school, I was always taught what, look, natural selection pressures would cause creatures to evolve new things needed to adapt to environments. Right. Here we've got species right. happening. There's no, there's no natural selection factor no, whatsoever. No, they just decided to eat new food. And then <laughs> mates decided to hang out with this one instead of the other one, and yeah. then those genes get isolated, et cetera. Yeah, amazing. Yep. Uh, li fish living in, in uh, the same lake can also uh, it seems, become separate species, right. reproductively isolated uh, uh, in, in a way because of food choices. Again, it's the same right. type of thing as, as the, uh, the insects there, which leads to different sizes and thus different mating choices. Right, it's so kind of like the Great Danes foods. and the Chihuahuas. They, yeah, it's kind of like that again. So right. uh, it, it's, the, it's the same kind of thing. There's no physical barriers. Food choices led to a change in size, and then you have, you have speciation as a result. Right. It wonderfully fits with creation. <laughs> In another instance, several species of wasps appear to have uh, been, been thrust apart from a okay. single ancestral wasp uh, population by way of nothing more than differing sp uh, species of bacteria in their gut. So here they are living in one area, uh, certain ones get certain types of bacteria in their gut, and somehow the bacteria in the females destroy the DNA from males of the other species. and. Uh, you know, there's been other mechanisms of speciation mentioned uh, as well in this report, which is, are simples as, uh, as, as things like the song of, of, of one bird. 
um, you know, attracting certain mates or, uh, or certain pigment genes atta- attracting certain mates and things like that. So we're watching rapid speciation happen. That fits with the creationist model. It right. doesn't fit with the evolutionary model. So, so it sounds like there's, there's quite a number of different mechanisms here which could produce speciation in groups of living things. Exactly. It fits beautifully with the Bible. Exactly. Things that happen after flood. Also hybridization, mm. mixing of genes from two distinct species uh, to form a third, right. a hybrid, uh, reproductively distinct grouping. That, that can sometimes produce different species as well. Creationists would hold that two species which hybridized were likely to have previously formed from a single ancestral population or a single original kind. Right. We're going to say more about that on next week's episode. Yeah. And, and, but this is a non-evolutionary process. It's a non-information gaining process. Right. Uh, it's speciation, but it has nothing to do with evolution. Uh, once again, again, no new information appears uh, out of nothing, which um, which was not already existing in the living world and at that time. And that would time. have to occur if evolution was to have happened on this that's planet. That's the name of the game with evolution. It's new information. And speciation is seen as, well, that's something new. Right. You've got one species and now there's two. It's something yeah. new. But when you look at it at a, at a, the way scientists need to, at a detailed level, yeah. there's no new information. Speciation, yes. Yeah. Evolution, no. That's exactly. what's going on there. So this idea of rapid speciation, so important to the creationist model, is, surprise, surprise, <laughs> <laughs> supported by scientific observations in a huge way. And even though rapid speciation can be incorporated into an evolutionary uh, model, it doesn't provide any support for the big picture of evolution. Yeah, well, rapid speciation is actually difficult for them. That's, uh, no, yeah, it fits in. Yeah, but well, they fit it in now because they're observing <laughs> it, so it's got to fit somehow. Right, yeah. But it uh, wasn't there in the beginning. It doesn't surprise, you know, provide support for evolution, really, in the sense of brand new genetic information being formed. Right. Um, and, uh, of course, the biblical creation fall flood uh, migration model predicts rapid formation of new species, uh, you know, and varieties. And this is because all of the modern varieties of land vertebrates must have descended from a comparatively a few uh, a bunch of animals uh, that disembarked from the ark only about 4,500 years ago. Right. So in contrast, yeah. Darwin thought that this process would normally take eons to occur. Yeah, yeah. It turns out that the, uh, the evidence actually supports the creation model. And we'll be right back. Dogs vary greatly in size, from Chihuahua to Great Dane, yet they are all part of the dog or wolf created kind. They can all interbreed. Researchers have found that the small breeds of dog have something in common, a mutation in a gene that codes for an important growth regulator. This prevents the small dogs growing to normal size. Mutations do that sort of thing. They destroy normal biological functions. Some of that destruction might be entertaining for us, producing cute miniature dogs that don't cost much to feed. But mutations won't create the complex blocks of genetic instructions needed to produce the growth regulator in the first place. Evolutionists say that mutations change dinosaurs into birds and apes into people. But how can mutations which destroy complex information do that sort of thing? Modern biology really shouts creation, not evolution. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, our topic today is uh, speciation, yes, Evolution, no. And we've shown you a lot of examples of why rapid speciation uh, actually supports the creationist model, not the evolutionary model. Yeah, there's evidence for the biblical model. And and to to give you an example of how evidence for biblical creation is spun to make it look like evidence for evolution, let's look at the following story. This is a news headline here. Evolution simulated in the lab. There it is there. An article in the prestigious journal Nature claimed that a research study published last week had successfully recreated the South American butterfly, Heliconius herupa, which has red-orange and yellow-white stripes on its wings. They did this, the article said, by seeking to, quote, recreate the evolutionary pathway that gave rise to it. Right. Okay, so there's the news report. Uh, Other news media carry this story as well, of course. Uh, BBC reporting that the study demonstrates that two animal species, there's a quote, two animal species can evolve from one. Right. But is this really evolution? I mean, a closer look at the facts show otherwise, right? Researchers had suspected that H. Euripa uh, might be a hybrid of Heliconius uh, sidno, which had a yellow stripe, and Heliconius melpomenine, which has a red one. So the researchers interbred these two species, 
creating a butterfly with the two-stripe pattern of H. Euripa within just three generations. Okay. And there was no need <laughs> to uh, physically separate the two-stripe butterflies from the others in order to maintain the purity of the newly bred H. Euripa. Um, uh, butterflies tend to choose partners that look like themselves, said one researcher, um, uh, Chris Jiggins of uh, Edinburgh University. So once the new pattern was established, these individuals have tended to mate with one another and shunned their parental species. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fine. So there's there's an example of it happening. Yeah. But when we look at the details, did we see any new, brand new genetic information form that wasn't already in the? It's a mix of information that was already there. This exactly. is it's a fantastic example of rapid speciation. It fits beautifully with the Bible. Yeah. No surprise to creationists. However, yeah. uh, it's not evolution. No, genetic in, no new genetic information uh, was produced. The butterflies are still butterflies. The hybrid species simply having an assortment of genes inherited from right. the two parent populations. Yep. Um, and, and that story is kind of the, uh, the opposite to this one. Uh, this is still touted as evolution. Uh, look at this report from the star.com. Is it a coyote? Is it a wolf? Yes, and yes, it's a koi wolf. Uh -huh. The predators that are plaguing Durham region and showing up in urban areas appear to be an emerging species resulting from wolves and coyotes interbreeding. Well, we'd agree with that. We, we, we see that stuff happening yep. all the time, but look yep. how they describe it. The larger, highly adaptable animals have the wolf characteristics of pack hunting and aggression of the coyote characteristics of lack of fear of human developed areas, says Trent University geneticist Bradley White, who's been studying the hybrids for 12 years. We're seeing evolution in action, he says. Now, isn't this what we see in the news reports all the time? Look, it's more evidence of evolution. It's a snow it's, job. Yeah. It's, it's evolution only if you limit the meaning of that word to what creationists would agree with. Right. Animals change. Speciation happens. If you want to call that evolution, well, that's very confusing. Right. right? If I take a Great Dane and I take a, like a German Shepherd and I breed them together and they produce a hybrid, is that evolution? I mean, that's the, the sim <laughs> simplistic explanation he's saying here for a wolf and, and, and a coyote breeding together. And we're seeing evolution in action. But without understanding the details, the people who read that article years ago are not going to get the impression that, if, if you look at the details, it's not evolution in terms of microbes to man, particles to right. people. Lizards kind of, turning into uh, birds where all of a sudden they have that wings that never existed before. So there, there's confusion in this area, certainly. Right. And, and one of the... One of the DVDs that, that we carry uh, is a great DVD called Dynamic Life, Changes mm. in Living Things. Dr. Carl Wieland, sort of the grandfather of the ministry, he yeah. started Creation Magazine on his typewriter uh, in the late 70s. He, he explains the differences between natural selection, what creation is what we've always agreed with, yeah. and evolution that's discussed in, in, uh, in theory, particles turning into people and so on. It's a great DVD. You can get it at a discount using a code. Here's the, we'll put the code up on the screen, CMLDL, Dynamic Life, Creation Magazine Live, Dynamic Life, you can get 50% off. Right. So when you go, on, go online, as you're checking out, put that coupon code in there and you'll get 50% off of this fascinating DVD by Dr. Carl Whelan. I remember watching that DVD and as a former evolutionist, it blew my mind to see all that evidence that I'd been taught yeah. as proof of evolution yeah. actually supported the Bible. It, it was amazing. Yeah. I encourage you to check it out and we'll be back. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation-evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each journal of creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. Welcome back. Uh, this is the feedback section. We often get feedback uh, from articles that we write, sometimes from yep. the TV episodes here. And so here was a, uh, a response uh, from somebody uh, writing from Australia, and they said this, um, Dear Sir or Madam, uh, I wish to object strongly to your ministry's representation of the Bible's re recount of creation in Genesis as a valid scientific alternative to mainstream cosmology, geology, and biology. As a Christian, I take seriously the task of reading the Bible. Seriously, but not literally. It is significant on this first Sunday in Lent and the 9th of March, the lectionary readings for the temptations of Christ include passages from Genesis about Adam and Eve's temptation. 
Serious exegesis leads the reader to a deeper understanding of the human duty to resist temptation while a pilgrim on the way to the cross at the end of Easter. The details of the type of fruit or serpent or the alleged dimensions and location of Eden are not important. As an enthusiastic astronomer and physicist, I also perfectly accept that the universe is 13.8 billion years old and the earth is 4.6 billion. Evolution occurs just as our understanding of science and the gospel does. Yours faithfully. KG from Australia. Okay, yeah, so there's the letter in, uh, in full. Yep. And then, uh, as usual, as we usually do, one of our folks, uh, uh, scientists or speakers, uh, responds to it uh, in interspersed fashion. One of the right. comments that we, that, 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 was, uh, uh, that we mentioned was actually the serious way to take it, to, to take the Bible, uh, is governed by two principles. Number one, recognize Scripture as God-breathed. Number two, the true meaning of Scripture is the meaning of the that the original readership would have understood by the words the inspired authors used. Exactly. So, you know, it's interesting to, to even hear this kind of phrasing, because I've heard this kind of thing before. I've seen it on church billboards as you're driving along sometimes. Yeah. You know, we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. Not literally. And it's like, you know, if you applied that to anybody that you really... Uh, hold in high esteem or, or, or that has authority over you. You know, if I was to tell my wife, you know, honey, I take you seriously, but not literally. <laughs> or if I was to tell my employer, um, I take you seriously, but not literally. Oh, you mean you really wanted me to do that? Oh, you mean I'm supposed to actually do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, that, think about this. Part of the confusion is over the word literal, right? It, 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 what, it, what literal means is you take it as it's written. Right. Not a wooden literalism. And, and people say, well, biblical literists, they, you, you, do you guys believe that the trees of the field literally clap their hands? <laughs> well, no, no. That, yeah. Taking something literally means taking it in the form that it's written. Right. We understand there's many different types of how literature the, within Scripture. Yeah. How did the original audience... How, would, how were they intended That's to the interpret key. what the scripture said? Right. So, of course, there's things like poetic, uh, you know, poems and there's allegory and there's, uh, you know, Jesus would use, uh, you know, different ways to explain things, different parables and things like that. But the fact is understanding that it's a parable is taking it in the yeah. literal, grammatical, historical context. Yes. We understand. But even a parable has a literal moral explanation. It's, it's got a meaning to that. Yeah, literal is just a confusing word. It, That's right. A word that we're using more and more often within, within CMI, Creation Ministries International, is take it straightforwardly. That's right. Just take the word literal out because so many people are confused by that. Yeah. We take it straightforwardly. We right. take it in the way that it's written. Exactly. And uh, if it's parable, you take it as a parable. Don't pretend that it's real history. It's a parable. That's right. Um, you know, if I, if I go to have a meal and I say, boy, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. <laughs> Most people aren't going to go, wow, Cal wants to eat a horse. They go, wow, Cal's really hungry. Yeah. That's the literal or or plain meaning of what I said, even though I gave right. you some... It's a figure of speech, exactly. and everybody gets that. That's so. right. So what we're saying is, no, we take the Bible as plainly written, and when you read Genesis, it really is supported as real history. We'll see you next time. <laughs>